Admin, we're ready for our second session now. And we do request you to kindly settle down. For those of you just walking to the hall, please do take your seats. As our online activities and transactions surge, so do fraudulent schemes. In the face of this rising risk, financial institutions must balance their obligations to KYC compliance with digital innovation. Let us hear about it in detail in the impact of digital identity and KY solutions on regulation with our very revered speakers for this session. And without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd invite you to kindly join in in the round of applause as I invite all our esteemed panelists to join us up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite up on stage Mr. Shitij Talwar, the General Manager and Senior Vice President CRIF Digital and Open Banking Solutions, CRIF. Let's have a round of applause and welcome Mr. Shitij Talwar. I believe a louder round of applause is in order. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's, let's all be participative. Thank you so very much. Welcome Mr. Talwar. Do join us up on stage. We'd also like to welcome Mr. Arpit Ratan, the co-founder and business head at Sainzi. Thank you for joining us, sir. I'd like to welcome up on stage Mr. Vriju Ray, CBO IDFI. Thank you so very much, sir, for joining us. I'd like to welcome up on stage Mr. Sagar Tanna, co-founder and CEO of TrackWiz, uh, TSS Consultancy Services. I'd like to welcome you up on stage. Thank you for joining us, sir. A round of applause to Mr. Shankar Palayaniyadi, the co-founder and CEO of FRS Labs. Uh, let's welcome Mr. Shankar up on stage. Thank you for joining us, sir. And we have uh, Pankaja Bora, DGM, DOS, Nabad. I'd like to welcome Ms. Pankaja up on stage. Let's have a big round of applause. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. And the session will be moderated by Mr. Amit Goel, advisor, Prove. I'd like to welcome him up on stage. Let's have a big round of applause, please. Thank you so very much. Ma'am, gentlemen, and with this, without any further ado, we can commence the session. And I'd invite our moderator to kindly take the session forward, please. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, just a quick uh, poll. How many people are from banks or financial institutions? OK. How many people are from fintech companies? All right, thank you. How many people are from KYC, EKYC, uh, you know, AML, CFT, digital onboarding companies. All right. So it's a very good mix. Perfect for us, I, I think. <laughs> so uh, before we start the session, I would like to say one thing that I have observed wherever I have, uh, you know, gone. I built and sold a fintech company and um, interacted with a lot of people in fintech communities, you know, across the world. One of the things um, I keep hearing is that India is the best when it comes to digital identity. We build something phenomenal called Aadhaar, uh, which in terms of coverage and functionality and how it has delivered is just unprecedented. And it has led to a lot of solutions on top of it, which is something we will discuss today. So uh, I, I think a good place to start will be just to set the record in terms of what is digital identity. And uh, you know, I think maybe Shitej, if you can just take a minute and explain what digital identity is, just basic 101 definition. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Shitaj and uh, I represent Griff. Um, you know, I don't want to take a lot of time. Digital identity can be a very long topic. Uh, if I have to, in 30 seconds, say what digital identity is, uh, it's a unique identification that identifies uh, an individual, non-individual, or a system. Now, uh, an example here could be a username is a digital identity. Biometric can also be a digital identity. PI information in an electronic format is also a digital identity. So all of these in, in totality is what digital identity is about. So there are two broad categories. One is in uh, digital attributes and digital activities. An attribute could be your PI information, biometric information, which uh, singles out you as, a, as an individual. And digital activity essentially is your geolocation, your uh, uh, purchases, your search history, all of this is digital activity. So together, this is what digital identity is all about. 
right? You know, uh, 20 years back, you could go to a bank, carry all your paperwork, and get an account open. Uh, when we started doing digital, um, one of the issues was the internet did not have a digital identity layer. So some of the companies on this panel actually build that. We, as a nation, we had to build Aadhaar and build some of these solutions. Uh, the essence you will see across what we'll discuss today is, I like to describe it as a seesaw game. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of people would have played seesaw. So you have convenience on one side, you are trying to make things easier uh, for everyone, but at the same time, you want everything to be very secure. Uh, both from who are you onboarding and are the transactions secure or not. Right, that balance is what all of us are trying to find and I think in this panel, we'll try to cover a lot of things so that anybody new who is starting in digital entity can learn from it. Uh, bankers or FIs who are customers of some of these solutions can uh, would be able to understand what is new, what is the future of this. So that is the purpose of this, uh, this panel. Um, as the topic said, right, that we, we got the topic in the form that uh, what is the impact of digital entity and KYC solutions on regulation? And then some of the people in the panel said, but it could be the other way around also. What is the impact of regulation on digital entity and KYC? So I have changed that question and I'm going to ask it to everyone as a common question that what is the relationship between digital identity, KYC solutions and regulation? Either ways you can take it depending on what your perspective is. So maybe we can start uh, from that side. Shitesh? Yep, sure. I, I, it seems like I'm on the hot seat today. <laughs> yeah, all the questions starts from this side and then goes. Uh, the right uh, side. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, if I have to look at uh, digital identity and AML and KYC and their impact on regulations, right? So as I described what digital identity is, you need, there's, when the world is moving towards digitization, there, is, there, is a, there has to be uh, some kind of an establishment of trust and credibility in the entire system. I need to, so when my transaction is happening online, the bank needs to identify who I am. When I'm trying to apply for a loan, bank again needs to identify who this uh, loan seeker is, and vice versa. If I am trying to do pass on, uh, I'm, I'm looking at transferring money into a merchant, I would want to understand who that merchant is. So when this entire system is established on credibility and, and trust, then the KYC and AML and recognition and trust comes as a, an important uh, uh, element. Now, uh, looking at this particular question, now if I have to expand that into uh, looking at how regulations are looking at uh, a digital identity, one could be simply looking at regulations that you have to follow this, and because it is a guideline, it is a set standard, but the other way is also to establish credibility as an organization, as, as an entity, that I am doing business with trustworthy people. So when I'm looking at uh, regulations, how it impacts KYC, and how it uh, impacts uh, uh, any other kind of uh, identification process, it is, it is working as an enabler. Now, enabler can be of two types, if, if I, to my mind, one is, an enabler where a regulation is being created and the regulations are so open that it allows innovation, that it, it allows, it enables people and fintech companies and banks to innovate. The other way of looking at regulation is also from the point of view that the regulation defines boundaries, the boundaries which are largely good for society. And I'm taking a very holistic view over here, uh, but the boundaries are defined. Now, people would want to, so, People or innovators or banks or financial institution or any organization would want to operate within that boundary. So the regulations are enabling the movement or the, the growth in that specific boundary. So both of these, one is innovation based, one is the boundary based, but both are enablers uh, to my mind. And that is what uh, regulation uh, in total uh, kind of comes together uh, with uh, identification or, or, or uh, KIC and AML. Thanks, Shadish. Arpin? Uh, yeah, so uh, what we think about entity, actually we think about it in three parts. Uh, one is the ability to identify uh, basically who you are. Second is ability to know whether you're trying to impersonate, are you a fraudster, do you have a criminal background, is there, are you going to use my system to launder money or do an illicit trade? which is saying that who I don't want to come into my system. And the third part is authenticate, which is that if once I've got you in my system, how do you recognize you the next time I see you without having to each time 
uh, do the whole process, right? So if you think about any industry, including financial industry, we call it KYC. Uh, from the days of PMLA, we started using the term KYC. But uh, essentially, it was that, okay, who's my customer? I'm, I want to make sure they're not a fraud. And the next time they want to transact money with my bank, I want an easy way to identify them during that transaction. Uh, the way at least I think, and, and we yes debated this uh, as well is, uh, I think actually digital identity has influenced regulations. If you look at India as an example, uh, when we go back to our initial KYC regulations, they were physical, they were person meeting another person and ability to then uh, identify them both as a person and their address where you were meeting them. And today we have evolved uh, with an RBI to a video KYC where we don't need to meet the person largely because as identity, we no longer care about our physical address. So the banker does not need to come to my home. I, my entire transactions are digital. Therefore, only thing I need to do is who you are. Are you alive? Are you a real person? And that's it. So the regulation evolved to meet the need of the identity that it exists today. And if you look at KYC, you have three different KYC uh, regulations within three regulators in India. Uh, gaming now has come up with its own KYC regulation because their digital identity means that I want to make sure that this person who's transacting is linked to the bank account and that's it. I really don't care if you know what your address is, what your background is. Uh, when you come to social media, you want to make sure the person is not impersonating. So you have a new way of identifying within social media. Twitter has started, LinkedIn, uh, you know, none of us, but one of the other companies has kind of started with LinkedIn in India. So if you look at all players, eventually will come out their own way of doing these three things. Uh, in India, our financial regulations on KYC, we call it, is very far evolved. But as we see more and more digital entity uh, being available across systems, you will see that each system will somewhere influence the regulation to make uh, either a new law, like you're seeing in gaming now, or it will modify an existing law. Well said. We will come back to, however, the issue being that there are so many methods of KYC and onboarding, it's very confusing sometimes for the from a customer perspective, how to choose, what to choose and all. But we'll come back to that. Shankar. Uh, I have difficulty explaining this to my own team. So I use a very simple example of uh, doctor, medicines, patient and nurses. So doctor, you can consider them as a regulator. You know, they, they want the best for you. They want the best, uh, you, the patient has to be alive. And so they prescribe medicines. So they sort of look at your vitals and then they prescribe medicines. And if you look at, if you read the KYC regulations, they're very prescriptive. They're open to a lot of interpretations. Um, and it's very illegible as well at, at, at times if you sort of, if, if you see the analogy with the prescriptions, the way it is written. And the nurses are the compliance team. So they, they always run, run around like their head is on fire. And when the doctor looks at the patient and he prescribes medicine, and then he will always go, uh, I'll ask you to sort of come back after two, three months. And you know, I, I want to sort of check whether these medicines are working or not. So the regulations sort of work in similar ways. So when the regulations are out, companies sort of scramble together to find a, a journey solution, try to find a fit. And then we go and implement that solution um, with, with, with the banks that we're working on. The regulator, the regulator would collectively see after three months or six months saying, you know, is, you know, is there a change in behavior? Because most, most of these pres prescriptions are really to drive banks, insurers and telecoms or regulated entities in, in totality to behave in a certain way. And then they come back and they change the regulations, uh, so to speak. So that's why we see so many of these regulations uh, just sort of coming on and off throughout. By the time the first regulation came out in KYC, um, maybe two decades ago, and the way that we're seeing now, so much has changed, and most of it is sort of influenced by what the banks and what the regulated entities are doing, and you know what's happening with the consumers and, and the progress that they're making and the changes that they want to see from the regulator. Uh, so that's really sort of the, uh, the, the combination that I see between all, all, all of them. Interesting. Did you? <clears throat> I'll go next. So my grandmother died in 2015, and she used to have a post office um, balance and fixed deposits there. And um, after she died, there was this matter of uh, withdrawing the deposits from post office. 
So now they didn't actually have an online presence, or at least nobody read emails in that post office. They are somewhere in, in Alipur in Calcutta. And uh, this gentleman, we tried to reach him via agents to see if he'd be able to withdraw, if he'd allow us to withdraw the fixed deposit. And for about a couple of years, nothing happened. And then I went to Calcutta myself, um, and I met the gentleman. His name was Sagar, also. <laughs> so he said, uh, Arey, I have seen you since childhood. And um, you are so and so. Come, come, come. Sign here. And that's how it took off, really, right? So it made me wonder three very important things about the industry we are in. Number one, it kind of runs on trust. It is important that people trust each other because you're entrusting the money with the post office or the bank, and, you know, and they are giving it to you after verifying who you are, even if it's a slightly old school way that the post office used to verify me. right? The second interesting part is how digitization would mean that I could operate it from Bombay if I wanted to. And so if I tried to do so, Sagar would have to trust me without actually meeting me, in which case I need to have the identity system that would allow such a trust to coexist. So I need to have ID cards which are verifiable, government systems that you can check, and then you can say, oh, this is the person. And also I need to authenticate this is the Reju whose ID card was presented. So that was the second thought I had around it. And the third thought was, what if I am in various other banks and I'm kind of a criminal. Let's say I've done some money laundering or whatever, right? The post office actually wouldn't be able to do any of these checks, especially if it wasn't centralized. And back in the day, post office and banks you used to have their identities by branch, right? You would have to go to a new branch and say, I'm from this branch, and they might be able to look up your data from there. So I think broadly with digital identities, now what it allows you to do is to bring together information from disparate sources so that you can track criminals. And I think that's where the government is fairly interested in. I think I'll leave it at that because there are two important experts with me here who can speak at length about uh, money laundering, etc. So you want to go next? Yeah, yeah I think um, uh, like Arpit mentioned, uh, the first part about was establishing as in who you are. Uh, are you the same person? Is your document uh, you know, saying who you are? And that's perfect. Um, I would like to put myself on the second part, which is basically trying to ensure that you are not a part of any blacklist, sanction list, um, unethical list, or you're not a relative to a politically exposed person, um, things like that, right? So um, while, uh, you know, he could, uh, you know, the Sagar there could say, okay, uh, you're, you're the grandson and I know you well. Um, that Sagar couldn't check whether you know Riju is now a part of any of the sensitive list, right? Um, and there are two parts to this. <laughs> there are two parts to this. One, of course, is uh, doing a check, um, you know, which is before commencement of relationship. And the second, and I think which is even more crucial, is to have that check on a continuous basis. So if you have a relationship with the customer for a three month or a five year period, depending on what product it's extremely essential to keep that uh, check happening you know, at a periodicity. Of course, regulation says daily, um, but I think that portion of ensuring that this person is clean continuously is, is very, very important. Maybe, ma'am, you want to talk about the... Um... Yeah. Uh, basically, I would like to uh, sum up uh, like what we all have said so far. So here we have three components. First is the digital identity, then we have the KYC process or the solution, and the third is the regulation. According to me, all three are very interconnected. So if, the, uh, if there is an advancement in the digital identity, like if the technology advances, you have now blockchain and AI-enabled digital identity. So with that, the KYC process evolves. It becomes more efficient. And uh, the customers, they feel more secure uh, with their information, their personal data. And at the same time, business can secure that data seamlessly. They can secure whatever information they want. So that part is taken care of. Now coming to the regulation, as regulation evolves, what happens These FinTech companies, they come up with more robust solutions, the ID solutions, which again makes the KYC process more comprehensive. And this goes on. But here, what I would like to, I mean, the first speaker, what he said, I also uh, believe in this point that the regulators, they have to be technology active. 
this is what FATF uses this term, technology active regulators or supervisors. They have to give you that environment where trustworthy technology solutions are provided within the regulatory bound. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I think a uh, good segue into the second topic. Let's double click on some of the things you guys have said. Um, so Arpit, uh, you know, I wanted to start with you. Uh, and you know what I have done is that uh, basically I know which areas you and your company work in, and you know based on that I have selected some topics to go, go double double click on that. And so explain us that in terms of KYC solutions, identity, uh, you know, authentication, uh, and given that digitization is happening at an incredible pace, uh, how are things? What is the current status? And as well as how should a customer think about like if i'm a bank a financial institution or a like a consumer tech company with all these options you know six different ways in which i could do kyc and onboard a customer how should we think about it uh, yeah yeah i mean it's very confusing right? i think when we started the company uh, way back 8 years ago it was very very simple today you have so much you have digi locker you have aadhar now you have kyc setu these are just purely coming from one source and then you have LinkedIn, you have email, you have phone number based KYC data. And, and then uh, apart from just the Aadhaar, you have driving license, passport, voter ID, PAN, right? So I think in India, uh, we were uh, originally a data uh, deficient country, but now we are, we are more than data surplus uh, because of the infrastructure that we have built in the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, for clients, I think it is not easy today as it was maybe eight years ago. I think the only way we solve it and we would advise anyone should solve it is that uh, you need to think like a toolbox uh, versus a one-size-fit-all approach. Uh, when you think like a toolbox means that uh, eventually every consumer will have a different need. Uh, what I mean by that is when we uh, kind of help some of the customers like I may have an Aadhaar handy with me, someone else may have a driving license handy with me, a third person, maybe an NRI and only has a passport, right? So, and all, and different KYCs can be done for all three. Uh, the idea is to build it like a toolbox and make it so modular that anyone who eventually interacts with your platform system, whatever you're using to onboard, uh, does not uh, get limited by the, uh, the ability of your system to onboard them. I think the government has done well to open up so many systems, but eventually uh, the intelligence uh, is to be built by the by the bank, financial institution, whoever is right. They need to be smart enough to build a system which allows your customers to be onboarded through any means that the customer wants, right? I, I think the, the reverse way of thinking is that when we used to talk to banks uh, long ago, bank, and that is how it has been, right? We were talking about prescriptive uh, versus, uh, so people have thought about KYC as prescriptive, right? I will form a form, I six things need to be done. My RM will go and they will do only these six, six, six things and then I'll allow the person to enter. I think that thinking needs to change slightly, right? I mean, you can't be uh, that uh, prescriptive. You need to be modular as an approach. So what you're saying is, if you build a dynamic solution which has a waterfall, let's say the first one is not working out for some reasons, maybe the data points are not there, let's go to the next one. And, and it could be cost-based waterfall, it could be yeah, data-based waterfall. Or you can be even smarter, right? I mean, you may, so if I come through mobile, I already have a mobile number. So a lot of people that we now see building solutions actually start using a lot of data that is available and then start asking the relevant question only. And depending on which channel you come from, you may already be able to identify some digital attributes about you okay. as a person. So the way, I mean, depends again, uh, I'm, I'm not restricting to finance as the only because KYC happens across, as you said, right, with even consumer techs. But I think the smart way to do it is, is that not limit yourself to a single process. Uh, to like really reinvent. I think the, this is a good uh, time for companies like us because uh, eventually KYC was always sought to be like this black box. It is no more the case, right? It is the driver of customer experience. There are so many fintech companies who have grown just because they, were, they had great onboarding, right? So the, I think finally KYC is the driver of customer experience and differentiation and therefore banks or whoever has to think innovatively of how they build that solution, not think of it like a black box, right? To your question, now, how do you solve it? There's no one answer. You need to think about your customer, how your journey is, how, which channels they come from, and, and then build something which is very modular for that. Correct. 
and today technology is there which makes it very possible to do that let me just add some more complexity you have talked about you know aadhar base cKYC digi uh, digi locker etc etc let's add one more angle to it with shitej so shitej uh, from bureau perspective uh, and account aggregator perspective i understand that there is a angle with which you can bring an identity solution right can you just explain in you know to everyone because i i believe a lot of people don't know about this this particular thing okay thanks thanks for the question in fact i was expecting that too okay uh, you know i'm not sure how many of you are aware of what open banking is about um, or what are the different stages of open banking so let me just start with a bit of an explanation of open banking it is about making the data residing in a bank of you as a customer transferable so entities outside of the bank can utilize that information to for evaluation or maybe for decision making so there are various different kinds of uh, information that is available with, available with bank it could be your uh, transaction information it is all the bank also holds a lot of uh, kyc information they also kind of uh, uh, perform their kyc checks over a period of time and and keep collecting that as as records on uh, so essentially an open banking provides that uh, platform where the data can move out an account aggregator is uh, an entity that facilitates this kind of movement of uh, data outside of the bank obviously this is happening with the consent of the customer so the so the customer at every point in time is aware that what is the data that is moving out or what for what duration will this data be stored for what duration will this data be utilized so as a customer uh, i'm aware that what is the utility and or the utilization of data so this is where account aggregator comes in and this is where the consent based frameworks uh, step in now if i look at uh, the question that uh, was asked now amit asked that how is bureau plus uh, account aggregator is helping now there are now what is what happens over here is uh, there's a lot of information which can now essentially move out and if i have to look at uh, draw a parallel with the erstwhile kyc process which essentially kyc or aml both are included in this case is a is a paper heavy uh, it's an uh, it's a cost heavy uh, kind of uh, interaction uh, so essentially what happens here is i would collect documents as arpit mentioned then i would uh, look at signatures uh, as uh, uh, riju mentioned uh, sagar also mentioned about uh, the the negative checklist and all and imagine if this has this activity has to be repeated time and again you keep doing this activity every 6 months every 2 years or if on a periodic basis depending on how you risk profile a particular customer now imagine this process is expensive and time consuming now replicate the same process if it can happen digitally if the data is available through a consent based framework at any point in time uh this data can be put in frequency so you can keep refreshing this information not if not on a daily basis maybe on a six monthly maybe on a quarterly basis so open banking kind of provides you that kind of a framework where the the data comes in from one of the very credible sources which is a bank or any other financial or any other regulated entity uh number 2 this data has lot of transactions so you can evaluate customers incoming transactions outgoing transactions if it's a non individual kind of account uh, then you can also get to know his the incoming the expenses plus his buyers suppliers vendors so on and so forth so when you talk about kyc and aml you complete this entire process using an open banking consent based framework so the privacy of the customer is also not compromised because it's a it is a consent that the customer provides at the time of uh, uh, onboarding right so the customer is aware that the kind of information which is being shared and now that information is being utilized on a periodic basis to to one establish credibility as i mentioned earlier and second also to establish uh, um to kind of do the the necessary compliance and regulation uh, uh, adherences so that is where uh, an open banking account aggregator comes in and combine this with bureau now bureau holds a lot of information and this information is reported uh, by respective uh, regulated entities like a bank or an nbfc and they also keep collecting this information now combine this these two together you have a holistic a, a very holistic uh, view on a particular customer and various different so bureaus typically collect historical information so you have historical information and you have the real time information coming via account aggregator combined together to uh, complete your uh, obligations towards uh, the kyc and aml
Yeah, very interesting. This we have seen in some of the the markets, like especially Western markets. So let me take you to the next part of this journey. Let's say we have used one of these methods. We have done digital onboarding using eKYC. But if we have already done the KYC once, why do we need to do it again and again? I go to another bank, another place, I have to do it again and again. So there's this concept of reusable identity, right? So maybe, Sagar, if you can talk about CKYC. Like, I, I was in the US and they were talking about reusable identity as if this is like something in the future. And I had to tell them that we already are doing it. Like, we already have CKYC. But can you just uh, explain, and what is uh, the status currently? How far have we uh, arrived? Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. So um, the central KYC of India, um, you know, like other platforms, is the only utility in the world that has succeeded to actually come to the levels which it has. Um, so today there are 70 crore records um, in, in the central KYC utility. Um, and um, I, you know, one of the common questions that I keep getting asked is uh, why, if you already have Aadhaar, um, why do we need a CKYC? Right? I think there are three distinctions um, between it, and I think Aadhaar is important and CKYC is also. Um, the first distinction is as basic as a correspondence address. So Aadhaar typically just gives me the permanent address, and I don't have the correspondence or the latest address bas basically where you are. So CKYC actually gives me both. Um, the second uh, important aspect is um, Aadhaar uh, is an identity, like rightly said, and the CKYC is uh, is a KYC. That's why you have correspondence address, you have a PAN number linked, you have an Aadhaar driving license. So all these three documents, along with the ID numbers, is what um, you know CKYC can bring to you. And third and the most important is, um, when we talk about re-KYC, um, in CKYC, you have a feature where um, if a customer is dealing with, let's say, two banks, four, two brokers, and say three insurance companies, if that customer changes address with anyone, right, CKYC will notify the other six, saying, hey, uh, Riju, your address has, uh, you know, or, or Riju's address has changed to the other six institutions, right? Now, imagine if these six institutions reach out to Riju and say, we've come to know that you've shifted from Pune to New York. Um, is that the case? And if Riju says yes, nothing else needed because the documents were already provided by the first institution, right? So I think uh, the whole concept of re-KYC, which happens after six months or two years of periodicity, has evaporated because whenever there is a change, I'm being notified beforehand. Right? Yeah. So that's so the thing of... Powerful support. mechanism. I mean, we are so far ahead of the rest of the world in some of these things. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Sagar, just one more thing, you know, I want to double click on the next, next aspect. So you have onboarded a customer. We are using one of the most progressive framework on reusable identity. Uh, but now the customer is actually doing transactions. Okay, it has lots of issues, right? Fraud, this, that. Can you talk about the types of fraud, name screening, sanction checks, et cetera, et cetera, which are done to prevent all of these uh, issues from happening? Uh, okay, so um, I think there are quite a few experts here. I'll just give my side of bit, uh, you know, on that. Um, two things. Uh, clearly, um, one of the areas that we're seeing uh, come up very well on the name screening side is um, the diversity of uh, the databases, right? So, uh, for example, we now have a list of um, blacklisted chartered accountants, uh, you know, that is openly available. You have a list of um, doctors, you know, who have been charged with something, right? Um, and, and I'll take that with a case study, right? So we had this uh, typical uh, example where um, there was this doctor who was bringing in large sums of money, right? Um, and also uh, ended up depositing some cash, right? Now, the question here is, uh, is, is that tax evasion or is that uh, proceeds of crime, right? Uh, there's always a thin line between the two, right? Um, I'll, I'll explain that with an example. So uh, if the doctor, uh, you know, has said that I'll do your surgery, um, just pay me cash, uh, that's tax evasion, right? And the moment uh, the doctor says, um, I'm going to tell you the gender of your upcoming child, and naturally it's going to be paid in cash, uh, that's proceeds of crime, right? 
So there are different angles to transaction monitoring and name screening, but the basic one is to, uh, is to be able to check whether this doctor is actually blacklisted. So I think the name screening uh, you know, is, is a very powerful way of uh, you know, doing it. Um, and if you add attributes like mobile numbers to name screening, I think it's just like an icing on the cake. And of course, there are different types of uh, you know, transaction monitoring. Yeah. Maybe there's more time we could take that later. Yeah. And I'm going to go to Riju, but just before that, um, I actually sold my, I, I don't come from this space, but I sold my company to an identity authentication company. I spent two and a half years building their India business. So a couple of things I'll add just from my perspective that uh, today it is possible to build very intelligent trust scores based on uh, the tenure of your phone. You know, for example, if you've taken a SIM card in the last 24 hours, that's a very big red flag. Uh, if, especially if something else is found to be not going in the right direction. So you can add, ask for another factor of authentication. So there are very intelligent trust scores being built based on hundreds of signals. Uh, there is also a lot of phone centric identity uh, solutions which are available today to you know, kind of uh, counter fraud. There is ways to replace OTP because OTP is seeing a lot of fraud in India. As, as you must have read, there are so many cases in the market. There's, there's now ways to not only improve OTP by doing it in the background, um, using telco APIs and all that, but also make it more secure using these trust scores. So some of these technologies today come together to make uh, authentication very, very secure. Um, but Riju, from your perspective, you want to add to the question I asked about fraud and what's happening, what, what is that you are seeing, what is the solution that you are offering? Yeah, um, before I start, I just want to do a quick poll. Um, if you are somebody who's been defrauded, some sort of financial fraud, or if somebody in your family or your close friend has been defrauded recently with some payment fraud or financial fraud, could you please raise your hand? I just want to see how many of you are there. <laughs> A few panelists as well. All right. <laughs> so I think I, I, I feel that this, this number is growing, and probably a lot of people here are shy, is my feeling. But uh, the recent stat is that 40-50% of people have actually experienced some sort of financial fraud. Um, so there's directionally, right, KYC is becoming easier. We are finding that the KYC we did five years back, as opposed to what we do right now, is vastly simpler. There is eKYC, there is CKYC, there is digital KYC. But then, if there is no respect to systems and the design is a little bit poor, or people take shortcuts when it comes to best practices, or if there's lack of awareness or education, right? then fraud is the consequence of the system that is very easy. So sometimes making KYC too easy can be a problem. So, and I have two examples to illustrate it, and yep. no offense to my colleagues here. So uh, first is, um, imagine Amit, um, I have his PAN number and date of birth. right? It would actually be possible for me to use these two fields to fetch his CKYC records and to progress to the point where if somebody doesn't care about whether I'm Amit or not, by authenticating me to see if my face matches him or not, right? Or if I'm live at all, because I could get his face from social media, right? I could easily be an Amit and then get a loan on, in his name and then default and screw his rating, right? So this is a real situation that might be happening and you might have, have seen these things happen. So it doesn't mean that the systems um, don't exist to stop it. For instance, from the CKYC systems, it's possible to like, take the documents, check if they're valid. It's possible to authenticate the user, to check if he's live or not. And then I can never be Amit. I can be stopped. But then this is something that the financial systems should be cognizant of, that you as banks and fintechs should be cognizant of, and, and make sure that you, you take care of fraud as well. A second example is, 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 a, is a ubiquitous payment fraud. And uh, one such example I have been defrauded is, is when I was trying to order wine from Pinky Wine, uh, which is a famous store in Bandra. Every year, somebody goes and takes over their identity. You'll find on Google uh, Pinky Wine, and if you're like me, never storing anybody's number, you'll go to Google and you'll find Pinky Wines and call them, and the guy will say, yes, yes, I'll send you wine, please pay, right? And then if you, like me for the first time, <laughs> actually end up paying him, you'll find the wine may not arrive. And so where did it go wrong? The problem is that simply by having somebody's account number, you don't know if it's Pinky Wine or not. Indeed, if you found the person on a payment app and it said Pinky Wine, you still can't trust if it's the Pinky Wine or some other Pinky Wine, right? 
And what is really happening here is, again, with the same pinky wine entity, there is very little, there is no way for me to know if he's a verified pinky wine or not. The systems simply haven't taken this into account. The architecture also hasn't taken this into account, right? It would be also nice to have databases, right? And some of us here have tried very hard to create databases, negative databases, where such errant pinky wines could be blacklisted. And, uh, you know, and uh, this has been so troublesome to get consensus around it, to get people to say, all right, we will report these issues in one place as an industry and keep it so that people can, for free, look it up. It's still so hard to do it because you get into realms of privacy and consent, right? And so there are some aspects of, you know, education awareness which are needed to overcome really design and system aspects that show up in these cases. I think, by and large, awareness of this part of, of this type of fraud is growing thanks to the amount of fraud. But one shudders to think, right, if your mom is doing something online or if your uncle is doing something online, anything might happen, right? Not everybody is aware of what's going on. And it's very easy to manipulate people through social means, right? So I, I think fraud is something which is one of the natural consequences of things getting too easy. It's important that while the regulators make it easy, that they take cognizance of fraud and bake it into the regulations. I also feel that as fintechs and banks, you have a responsibility to your users, and you should be cognizant of it too, to allow to, so that they don't get defrauded. Right. So two points. One, the seesaw example that I was giving in the beginning, right? Convenience and yeah. security. I think this pinky wines reminds me of this airline in US called Spirit Airlines, where if you booked a ticket with your credit card, there was a 50% chance that your credit card will be hacked <laughs> and will be used <laughs> in other towns. But it was very cheap, like you could buy like the cheapest tickets. So, um, you know, you would decide and do the transaction. <laughs> it was very risky. Um, and, and then I think the, the point that you were making, right, there is system redesign required, but the technology is available today yeah. uh, to, to redesign it, right? So, uh, very good points. Uh, Shankar, I, I think let's switch some gears, right? So, we have onboarded the customer, right? We have done it probably in several different ways. Uh, we have also done authentication, fraud checks and everything. But then, obviously, we all worry about certain things, right? There are challenges, right? Uh, can you touch upon some of the challenges that um, we face as, a, as an industry and uh, maybe as customers, as industry participants? Oh, I don't know where to start, but uh, let's unpack this a little bit. So. I'll, I'll just I'll just come back from regulations. So the challenges of regulations are you have to be compliant. So there's there's no other options for banks. You know, that once the prescription is out, even though it is bitter, you'll have to take it as per the doctor's advice. Now, when you go back, so when when we started our company, so just giving giving our own experience, so we looked at the regulations and and we looked at the onboarding process because we didn't actually have an onboarding platform initially, uh, like. Uh, Arpit was saying, so we had actually built a one fit um, kind of, you know, it'll be like a one solution fit all kind of uh, product, which we thought would sort of solve all the problems for banks, insurance, telcos, and so on. So it wasn't the case. It took nearly four or five years before we realized what the regulators were asking for. So when we went back to the, the very first, it, it only simply asked for uh, the proof of ID, proof of address, and photographs. So that, that was all that was there in the in the KYC specification, so to speak. Um, but then we were all, you know, taking pictures of uh, or photocopies, and then the true copies of the original were sort of verified, and then it was sort of submitted. I'll let the gentleman finish. I'll make it quick. <laughs> I'll make it quick. So that's so. So it was only the the, the the minimalistic things that were sort of required to be compliant. But when we started building solutions, like uh, Arpit said, so it wasn't that easy. Uh, the banks would actually have, oh, different jurisdictions or different states would actually define what the accepted documents were. And then it took several years before the regulations came in and said these are the four or five documents that are fully accepted. Now the those were the challenges at the time uh, when we started building these solutions. But um, when, when, when these regulations are passed, you know, most times, like, like I said, the compliance team would look at it and they would sort of run around like their head is on fire. Uh, it's mostly because the, uh, the regulations are subject to a lot of interpretations. 
And once they're sort of interpreted, usually we look at it from the, um, the customer experience point of view. And once that is sorted, then really sort of everything uh, sort of comes together. I sort of try and finish together. I, I don't know if, if, if I'd answered correctly or if there's anything more you want me to add. Um, I think you have covered it. Uh, let, me, let me now go to another angle, which is from a... Uh, Ma'am, you have worked at um, FATF, uh, you know, and, and several other initiatives. I wanted to understand from a supervisory perspective, because we have discussed a lot about solutions and, you know, the interplay with the regulations and all that. From your perspective, how do you see this space? And, you know, if you could add some, throw some light on it. Yeah. Thank you, Amit. Uh, uh, see, uh, what I understand is that we have a diverse landscape. Basically, I'll restrict myself to the banking industry because I'm from the banking industry. We have neo banks on the one end of the spectrum, and then we have our uh, regional rural banks and the rural cooperative banks. Now, these banks were created by government with a particular mandate that is financial inclusion. And if you see, they are not the banks which will kind of uh, seek profit optimization. So they have certain limitations. Resource constraint is one of them. And they are not being able to leverage on the technology front. That is also because of lack of awareness on their part. So and another aspect is the clientele. If you see the clientele, they are mostly farmers. And you have those small time entrepreneurs. So if you see, uh, if you see both the side, the supply and the side and the demand side, there has not been a momentum as we are seeing in the other spectrum with respect to KYC. Uh, AML CFT or the processes. So now what we need is, on the other hand, if you see, compliance is a big cost. Now we have the enforcement department with RBI, and RBI is also slapping fines, monetary penalties on these entities. And this has gained momentum in the last two years. This is what I have seen. And from the FATF perspective, if you see, their methodology now includes financial inclusion also. So from that perspective, these entities are very, very important. So now, what do we do for them? Like, if you see their uh, infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, they have the manual or the uh, paper-based KYC. Aadhaar is available, but the infrastructure for, say, e-KYC or what you say, video KYC is not there. So here maybe, and there is also another thing, like there is a gap. The, these uh, banks are not aware of what kind of financial you know, solutions or the KYC solutions are available. They do not know what kind of solutions fintech companies, low-cost solutions fintech companies are providing. And at the same time, the fintech companies are also not aware of what is their requirement, what kind of you know, customizable solutions they can provide. So if we can have synergy there, it will be a win-win situation. Uh, on the one extreme, we, we have uh, you know, systems like SingPass where you can open an account with 20 clicks. This is the Singapore-based ID system. And on the other hand, if we see these, I mean, these kind of uh, institutions, the KYC takes about two to three days. So how do we optimize? How do we uh, make the system more efficient and robust? So here, I think the role of fintech companies is very important. This is what I feel. Alternatively, what the government can do is that they can set up more common, uh, this, uh, common service centers where eKYC can be done, and it will be a smooth experience for the farmers. And then, as Riju said, awareness is again, is, is, is again the call of the day. These entities, the top management of these entities, they need to know what is the importance of KYC, what, you know, what, what actually it will trigger, ultimately, from the point of view of money laundering and terrorist financing, the sanction list that... Uh, Tushar was uh, talking about. So sensitization is required at the management level. This, we need to build the skill of the employees, basically, to understand how to track a suspicious transaction. So now how they are doing is mostly, you know, like it is, it is not on a real-time basis. What I'm hearing from you guys is like, you are talking about real-time, uh, you know, tracking of uh, suspicious transactions. That is not happening. Yep. So in uh, such a scenario, I mean, uh, we have to work, uh, we have to bring, yeah, yeah collaborate. So, so ma'am, basically what you are saying is there are like 450, 500 such banks. Yeah, 452. Are looking for solutions. Yeah. And all these guys are looking for business. Yeah, well, right. Right. So, uh, maybe after this session, we should have another one. <laughs> I am happy to moderate it, where we can actually connect these two things. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also would like to hear, apart from awareness, what I feel is like uh, you need to sin, uh, sen, uh, change the mindset of these entities. Like technology adoption should be an integral part of their culture. So that way their management has to encourage the you know, employees in terms of giving some incentives if they you know, go into the technology innovation space 
and then at the same time regulator also has to examine what is the objective with which they are going for technology innovation yep. and at last i feel there should be something like a kyc bureau uh, which will provide the trust framework, which will bring, bring together the authentication agencies or the data provider uh, entities, uh, or they can facilitate the cross-sector um, collaboration, say among I4C or the fintech companies or uh, say uh, FIU India and entities like NABARD and you know our, um, our supervised entities, which will create a win-win situation for all the uh, stakeholders and these banks will become financially more stable and they'll be resilient. I think this is our ultimate objective. Right. So this is a very good problem to solve. In fact, just to quote Dandan Nilegani, he basically always says that the role of technology is to lower the cost of distribution and reach to the masses. Right. That's how Aadhaar, you know, has such a coverage. Yeah. I think we should uh, definitely as a group discuss about this, how can we look at these banks. Um, we, I think we are running, um, you know, it's almost time. Uh, maybe I'll just say, you know, a session like this should end about what is the future, right? We have to look at the future, the go where the buck is. So maybe any two people who can volunteer and just go for it, right? Uh, anybody who wants to talk about future of, go ahead. So I think of identity as an onion um, in the sense that there are many layers to it. You have to peel it. Like at the core might be the fact that you exist. And then you might have to add other layers like what's his name, what's the email, what's the phone number. And then of course, where's his ID card. After that, maybe what's his financial information or what's his professional background. These are things that become fairly context sensitive very soon, right? So in short, you know, if, you, if you think about the future of identity, it probably begins with, right, control of this onion. <laughs> you know, I would, it'd be nice to actually have control of my own onion, you know, as a, as a consumer. It would be as a retailer, as a person, you know. I need to have control of it. It'd be nice if people ask me for consent. And that's something that's happening right now with the DPD Act and it's, it's real. The way people are looking at consent and managing it, it's an amazing development and it's, uh, you know, the kudos to the government to finally bring it out as an act. Um, second, of course, is the fact that when you think about what you need my identity for, right? If I give you my information as the entire onion, you probably don't need all of it. Maybe you just want to know what my age is or what is my, uh, I don't know, if, if, where do I live, right? You don't actually need to know my financial history for all of that. And so for me to be able to pick up elements of it and not share all of it, okay, so one concept around that is a zero knowledge proof, which is, I don't have to give you everything for you to know what you need to know. So I might withhold the knowledge, but give you the attributes that are important, which I think is an important element. Second is, of course, the way I might be able to separate out the different layers and take specific consent for it and allow to only pass that information that's needed. There's, there's a lot of platform play that I think is going to happen very soon in the identity space. And I believe this is... Um, one of the ways that identity is going to evolve. I don't want to go so far as to say that there'll be identity wallets everywhere, but I feel directionally, this sort of a control being given back to the end user is something that's going to happen soon. Right. You want to go? I'll just quickly add, I think we'll still have the same questions, uh, maybe 10, 20, 30 years from now. Who are you? Can you prove yourself? And then what if that turns out to be wrong? Or you know, is, is there a way that I can verify that claim as a banker? I think that, that will more or less be the same. Uh, and another fact, I think the regulations will be more, I think there'll be more regulations, not less. And so I think that will also be factual. And there'll be more fraud, not less. I think that will also be a, a given, uh, th given the way that, that things are going. Now, some 20,000 people are being scammed every single day in India. So that's, uh, that's what the, the cyber, secur cyber security portal is telling us. So given all this, so uh, I think I think I think where we will evolve, I, I think, will be a self-sovereign identity. It's something that you hold very close. It's not stored somewhere in the cloud. It's not on your device, but it will be it will be there in some form that only you will have access to it, and then you will have full consent to give it, and then you will also have full consent to take it uh, when you think it's no longer needed. I think that I think I, I think that that I believe will be the will be the future. Let's see. 
Let me just conclude it by saying uh, one thing from my side that I feel there's, the future is very near where you could create your identity and then it will be reusable, it will be interoperable. This technology today, like you can drop a token called FIDO token on this phone and keep authenticating from there on. And I'm very happy to also say that India will lead the charge. I think it is in this country that a lot of these solutions will be created first and the world will follow, just like wh what we are doing in digital identity payments and so on and so forth. So very excited. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank and thanks, everyone, for listening.